dark November morning, we set out on an adventure to the other side of the world. The first part of the journey went fine, from Dublin to Manchester City Airport. As we went to check in for the second flight, we expected the usual process. Would you like a window seat? Would you like an aisle seat? I gave my passport to the gentleman behind the check-in desk, started muddling around with my pockets, expecting the usual. And then I heard something. I'm sorry, sir, we can't let you fly today. I looked up, I thought he was joking. I'm sorry, sir, we can't let you fly today. Your passport is broken. I, I didn't really understand what was going on. What had happened was, he had found a rough edge around my passport, around the photo of my passport. And what it meant was, was that my passport was broken. It meant that he couldn't validate that I am who I say I am. And ultimately, it meant I couldn't fly. As I stood there holding this special person's hand beside me, three thoughts ran through my mind. Number one, will I get to where I was supposed to go? Number two, will I get to ask this special person a very special question? And number three, if I can't get to where I'm going and I can't get home, does that mean I'm stuck here forever? I think I've seen a movie about that. But that moment taught me something very, very important. That document that I had in my hand, that passport, that piece of paper is absolutely critical to who I am and it opens so many doors to me around the world. And that moment created an itch that I've been trying to scratch ever since. There has to be a simpler way. There has to be a better way. There has to be a digital or technological way to help me prove who I am to help me prove that Laurie is who he says he is. Today, I'm here to talk about digital identity in terms of yesterday, in terms of today, and in terms of tomorrow. Over the last 15 and 20 years, we have seen an explosion of interest in social media and social media platforms. Don't get me wrong, I use them myself. What we've seen is that we use these platforms to connect with one another. I'm sure we all use them. To share photos, to share videos. They're pretty amazing at what they do. But how do they work? We sign up, and effectively, it's as if a new identity is formed, our digital identity. It's as if we've been reborn online. So how do they work? These companies then track every single thing that we do. So, like little digital breadcrumbs that we leave behind, or a digital footprint that we leave behind. And what they do is they package that information, and then that is effectively used for companies to target us for products and services. So as I look at this young lady's beautiful black shoes in front of me over here, have they, did you buy them in a store, or have they been following me online for the last three weeks, and suddenly you felt compelled to buy them? You had to buy them. But it's not all bad and I'll come to talk about that in a moment. In terms of technology today, and digital identity today, there are some amazing things happening. If we think of Syria for a brief moment, a world and a land that my imagination can only begin to understand the hardship of those people. There's a specific case of a lady that I read about, and I've been reading intensely since. Her name is Amira. An Amira from war-torn Syria has moved from camp to camp to camp. And all along the way, she's had documents to prove who she is and to prove who her family are. But as time goes on, the documents become lost. They become frayed, or they even get taken away and confiscated. And with that, their identities disappear. Their rights disappear. What happens to these people? How do they exist? So as a part of technology for good, using technology as a force for good, there are entities around the world that are using technology to create identities for people just like Amira and her family. One entity or agency that's looking at this is the World Food Program. And what they've done is pretty amazing. They've created a digital identity for Amira. But how does this work? Effectively, what it is, is that it's a digital wallet 
that Amira has. And in that wallet, it says that Amira is who she says, he, says she is. Now, that's not that amazing. We could all do that right now. But where the trick, where the magic is, is how it all works. So what Amira does is she electronically or digitally sends a request to either governments, to reputable agencies, whether it be the UN or the Red Cross or UNICEF, to confirm or attest that Amira is indeed who she says she is. And this is stored on her phone, on a digital device. And all those attestations build up to her identity, to her digital identity. What's more is that now in the Zatari Jordanian refugee camp where Amira is based, is that with her iris, with her eyes, she is able to walk up into the, into the refugee camp grocery store. She walks up, she gathers her groceries, she walks up to the till, a laser scans her iris, and in an instant, her identity is validated through this digital wallet. Her identity is validated, the payment for the groceries that she's purchased are deducted from the amount she's received from the agencies. And what is even more spectacular and amazing and hope-giving is that as Amira moves to another refugee camp or to another country, her identity is with her forever. It's in her eye. It's in her digital wallet. And people can't take that away from her. It's amazing. It is the beginning of financial inclusion for Amira and for her family. We're seeing the social media companies. They get a lot of bad press but we're seeing them actually now help to contribute to validate who people are, who we are, in a positive way. There was a famous saying that The Economist came out with, that data is the new oil. Well, if that's the case, I guess I'm looking at 100 oil wells right in front of me right now. What do I mean by this? Today, our data is being used, and it's being used by companies, and we're not necessarily getting rewarded for that. What do people, or what do those companies do with that data? How do they use it? How long do they keep it? But my fundamental point is, I feel that if they're using my data, surely I should get rewarded. Surely we should get rewarded for sharing that data. Over the next 10 years, it's my strong belief that one of the most heatedly debated topics will be about digital identity, will be about us, each and every one of us, taking back control and more control of our identity as to who has access, what they do with it, and for how long, but pushing it even further to that as to how we individually get rewarded for our data, for what we do. If I pass it to you, what do I get, perhaps, in return for that hour, for that week, for that month, for that year? There's a great example that's already happening. For those lucky enough to drive Jaguar Land Rover cars, what they're doing right now is that they have onboard computers, like most cars today. And what Jaguar have done is, if you sign up and agree to share that information from your car back to Jaguar Land Rover, which they then pass on to other companies, you get rewarded. It'll go towards tokens for loyalty so that you won't have to pay for your, for your tolls or for parking. This is the beginning or one of the first steps where we will see people being rewarded for being you. So bringing this all together, the first thing that I will say about digital identity is to be aware. Be open-minded, be positive about it. The second thing is, is to understand where we are today and the amazing things that are happening, like the story that I told you about Amira and Syria. And thirdly, about how you all will be rewarded for being you. And one more thing before I go. I mentioned a special person with a special question. She said yes. <laughs> Thank you.